Um, my name is Christian Liddy. I'm from the Department of History here at, at Durham University. Um, and I've organised a series of public talks, uh, public uh, discussions, events um, around and about uh, the Charter of the Forest. Um, and welcome to the first of four talks um, and events. Um, I just thought I'd speak just for a couple of minutes at the beginning um, about the kind of the ideas behind the series before I introduce our very distinguished uh, speaker tonight. So, the origin really of the series lies in my um, involvement with the Magna Carta and the Changing Face of Revolt exhibition, which was held uh, in Durham in 2015. Um, which explored, uh, I suppose, the relationship between ideas of citizenship and practices of resistance all the way from Magna Carta to the, to the present day. Um, and uh, really that charter, so the, the exhibition model, was underpinned by some of my kind of research ideas about the nature of citizenship and the contested nature of citizenship and how issues um, about identity, um, belonging, um, uh, the rights and privileges of citizenship have really inspired um, conflict, debate, contestation all the way from the Middle Ages to, to the present. And in that exhibition we did show the Charter of the Forest, um, but um, only really sort of in passing, um, and it was very easy to miss. And indeed one visitor said to, said to me, you know, why was there not more on the Charter of the Forest? And actually this did strike me as kind of in odd for me because Part of my research has been to show that it's really in making claims to, um, to land um, and in disputes over land and access to land and, and access to natural resources that, in a sense, individuals and groups actually become uh, citizens. So it's something, I suppose, that was perhaps missing uh, from, that, uh, from that exhibition and something that I kind of wanted to address in, in this series. So that was 2015, this is 2017, and it's, as Simon said, another anniversary, the 800th anniversary of the Charter uh, of the Forest. Um, and the aim of the series of talks is really to place a spotlight on the Charter uh, of the Forest. And to think about the extent to which we may look um, at the Charter of the Forest in terms of its kind of relevance to some of the debates, contemporary debates today, about uh, privatisation of land, um, about the relationship between land ownership and land use, um, about the exploitation and management of natural resources. So in a sense, that the, the series is both historical and uh, contemporary. Um, and I would very much like your feedback. I think um, as you enter, Rachel, they kindly, dist Giles, they kindly distributed uh, questionnaires. And I know we're kind of weary of questionnaires, but it'd be very useful to get your feedback uh, on tonight's um, uh, talk, but also to, to, sort of, to make sure that you feel as though you're very much part of a debate uh, and uh, a discussion. Um, just to point out that obviously, the, as you can see, Giles is standing here next to a camera, that the lecture, the talk tonight is being filmed, but don't worry, no one else apart from the speaker who has given his permission is going to be filmed tonight, and we're going to stop the filming before, before, the, uh, before the questions. <coughs> um, so thinking then about the contemporary relevance of the Charter is something that I hope that we can perhaps discuss over the course of this series. And um, there are various institutions and organisations who have felt that actually the Charter of the Forest definitely does speak to uh, contemporary concerns. And at the back, behind my colleague, uh, uh, Dr Richard Hussey, um, there, are two, there are two tables at the back um, with material from the Woodland Trust who are launching a charter for trees, woods and people on the 6th of November 2017, the day of the actual anniversary of the charter. So if you're interested in the Woodland Trust and, and this charter, please have a look at the material at the back. I'm nearly finished. Um, I'd also like to thank Durham Cathedral, and in particular Lisa Di Tommaso, who is um, Head of Collections at Durham Cathedral, for um, bringing with, uh, providing rather, um, facsimiles, very good facsimiles, as Simon has said, of the 1216 Magna Carta and the 1217 uh, Charter of the Forest. So finally, the speaker, well not finally, the beginning. Um, I'm very, dis uh, very excited uh, to, uh, to introduce our uh, distinguished speaker this evening. I think that there is no one actually in the world who's better judged 
uh, and it's more appropriate to introduce this series. Um, Dr. David Crook um, is a world expert on the Charter of the Forest, on forests, on forest law in the Middle Ages. He has written um, uh, on the uh, origin of the legend of Robin Hood. He is both a distinguished historian and uh, a very distinguished archivist. He was um, senior archivist at the National Archives, before that the Public Record Office, uh, for, many, uh, for many years. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to introduce him uh, this evening. And David is going to speak on the Charter of the Forest itself. David. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much, Ken and Oliver. Uh, I hope that we are to see, get some length out of the slides. It's a bit uh, small, especially for the back. So I would encourage you, if you want to move further forward, please do so, because some of the things I'll be showing uh, are quite detailed, and I haven't got a bit enough screen to show them in huge detail. This cathedral church and the city take pride in possessing one of only two original copies of the Charter of the Forest, issued by the supporters of the young King Henry III, son of King John, on the 6th of November 1217, little more than a month after his 10th birthday. The other belongs to Lincoln Cathedral, and the successful conference commemorating the Charter was held in Lincoln a month ago. As I will show later, Durham's copy is in fact probably several months older than the Lincoln one, and is the only real, really genuine original, even though it is itself dated eight or nine days after the accepted date. But how did the Charter come about? The Forest Laws of England were introduced by William I after the Norman Conquest, as bemoaned by the Anglo-Saxon chronicler of Peterborough Abbey. He set up a great deer frith and imposed laws concerning it. Whoever slew a hart or a hind was to be blinded. He forbade the killing of bulls just as the killing of hearts. He loved the hearts as dearly as though he had been their father. Hares also he decreed should, decreed should go free. The rich complained and the poor lamented, but he was too relentless to care that all might hate him. That passage specifically states that both the highest and lowest in society hated the forest laws and complained about them. So, when the forest became one of the key issues at the time of Magna Carta in 1215, complaints about it were already over a century old. While many of the English forests created in the late 11th and 12th centuries were based on the king's own royal domain manners, they are extended to include the lands of other lords, severely restricting what they and their tenants could do on their own estates by way of clearance for agriculture, known as assarting, the use of wood for the construction of buildings, and hunting for food. It was this above all that eventually led to the growth of opposition by knights and free tenants, and also some monastic houses, who held land in the areas designated as royal forests to the forest laws and to the issue of the Charter of the Forest. King Henry I came to the throne in 1100 when his brother, William II, was killed while hunting in the New Forest. At his coronation, he issued a charter sent to each shire stating that he was retaining his forests with the common consent of his barons, as his father had them. This implied some condemnation of his dead brother's expansion of the forest beyond those created by the conqueror. However, Henry proved to be as passionate about his forest rights as any of his predecessors or successors, and did not hesitate to further extend his forests. According to order at Vitalis, Henry claimed for himself alone the hunting rights all over England, and even had the feet of dogs living in the neighbourhood of forests mutilated, only grudgingly allowing a few of his greatest nobles and closest friends the privilege of hunting in their own woods. Later evidence from the memory of local men enables to understand how the Royal Forest of Leicestershire was created during his reign. Henry hunted in a named wood, Reesborough, identified by Mondoc from Dondoc in the 19th century, as robbing a tiptoe hill near Tilton on the Hill and ordered the preservation of deer within it. Subsequently, his local forester apparently forested a much wider area around it by using natural and administrative boundaries to create a viable forest contiguous with the already existing forest of Rutland. The hill in question is there. That's the Rutland border. 
and the forest eventually encompassed this area down the line of these roads and streams. So that's the starting point and that's added to it. That's how I think it happened anyway. Sub uh, <clears throat> when Henry died in 35, the shuttles broke. According to the guest of Sivani, wild animals, which before had been most scrupulously preserved in the whole kingdom, as though they had been enclosed within hunting nets, were now fearlessly struck down by all. <coughs> when Stephen had obtained the crown and sought support, he too issued a charter of liberties, which included a clause by which he reserved to himself all the forests created by an unnumbered, while agreeing to give up those other by Henry I. But Stephen's political weakness meant that the forest laws could not be generally enforced during his reign. But the accession of Henry II in 1154 gave them renewed vitality. Henry himself, according to Gerald of Wales, was addicted to the chase beyond measure. At crack of dawn he was off on horseback, traversing waste lands and penetrating forests. Forest laws increasingly codified during his reign, and the forests of Henry I were restored and probably extended in the few years after 1166. In the forest heirs, that's judicial sessions in forest counties, of the king's notorious chief forester, Alan de Neville. He had a fearsome reputation. <clears throat> he was sent by the chronicler of Battle Abbey to have most evilly vexed the various <coughs> provinces throughout England with countless and unaccustomed persecutions in order to fill the king's coffers. When he died, the king is reputed to have told some monks who wished to take his body for burial, I will have his wealth, you shall have his corpse, and the demons of hell shall have his soul. His reputation survived to be mentioned frequently by juries who described the boundaries of the forests in the years after 1217. By 1170, the forests probably reached their greatest extent. Only six ordinary English counties, marked in red and forming a black in the east, never included the Royal Forest, Norfolk, Suffolk, Kent, Cambridgeshire, Hertfordshire and Middlesex although Cambridgeshire and Middlesex each contained a royal warren. Most forests were small. Hampshire and <coughs> Wiltshire in particular had many small forests, while further north, neighbouring Staffordshire and Shropshire were similar, with one forest, Breewood, straddling their boundary. About 1178, there was a clear and remarkable official statement of the extent to which the forest falls derived from the unbridled will of an autocratic king, made by Henry II's treasurer, Richard Fitzneil. The forest has its own laws, based, it is said, not on the common law of the realm, but on the arbitrary will of the king, so that what is done in accordance with forest law is not called just, without qualification, but just according to forest law. <clears throat> this being so, those subjects wishing to mitigate the effects of the forest laws in their areas could in practice only seek opportunities to persuade the king to delay particular administrative processes in the forest, or remove the application of forest laws from particular areas. And whether or not this ever happened under the Anglo-Norman kings is impos impossible to say, but the first recorded instance followed on Neville's forest heirs of the late 1160s. In the 1170, the whole county of Lancashire paid the king up 200 marks as a composition to postpone the survey being held in preparation for another forest fair, and did so again on four later occasions during Henry's reign. There is no suggestion here <clears throat> the extent of the forest in Lancashire should be reduced, just that surveys of it should be delayed. In the 1180s, three major programmes of heirs raised the level of ex exploitation of the forest laws to raise revenue for the Crown to new heights. But the accession of King Richard in 1189 briefly brought about a complete complete change in the royal attitude. The new king's uh, uh, plans were fixed firmly on his crusade, and in 1189 and early 1190, he raised funds by accepting payments of substantial fines from local communities to remove or reduce the extent of the forest in their areas. Richard accepted four such payments. Two were from the Knights of Surrey and the Barons of Bedfordshire, as a result, in 1192, when its payments were complete, Bedford became the very first forest, former forest county to escape entirely from the forest laws 
by a charter addressed to the earls, barons, knights, and free tenants of the county. The other two offers came from similar, smaller communities, one being the war potato of Ace in the west of York, whose men probably had financial assistance from the abbot of St Mary's York, which had some property there. The fourth came from the men of four adjacent villages in the Lincolnshire Fenland, who paid 100 marks for a charter dated at Dover a week before Richard embarked. They were associated with the prior of Spalding, who had just paid £100 for a similar charter of his own. Some of the meetings of these allies took place in one of his barns. It's the 15th century map of the forest areas, right there. And what was that taken out of the forest was affected the whole of this side of the fen, the whole of the east side. <clears throat> Other concessions were made to clergy in eastern England. The Archbishop of York offered 2,000 marks for the disforestation of all these lands in eastern Nottinghamshire, the estate of the Collegiate Church of Southwark. This was just one of several attempts by the Church of Southwark to remove its estates from subjection to the forest laws, all made without trying to work, without trying to work with lay landowners to move, remove the whole district from the forest. <coughs> and during Richard's almost total absence from England for the next eight years, no general fines for disforestation are recorded. However, Count John, the king's brother, who was left in charge of six counties and the honour of Lancaster during Richard's crusade, made forest concessions for cash to the Knights of the Honour and also to the Hell County of Devon, specified as including the earls, barons, knights, all free tenants, clerks and laymen of the county. He even made grants to a few individual manorial lords in the forest of eastern Derbyshire, including William Fitzwalkerlin of Stainsbury, confirmed by him as king in this charter of 1200. The resumption of forest airs in 1198 marked the beginning of the energetic governmental activity in the forest. According to the Yorkshire chronicler Roger of Haddon, who had himself served as a Northern Forest Justice in the 1180s, the airs reduced the whole of England to destitution. The Crown again accepted payments for concessions while at the same time exploiting the remaining forests through the impositions of the, forest, of the air justices, led by the new Chief Forest Justice. The aim was, mainly, uh, after Richard's death in 1199, to finance King John's wars in defence of, and then after the French conquest of 1204, his attempts to recover his duchy of Normandy. Many earlier forest charts were confirmed in the first two years of John's reign. Then in 1203, when his position in Normandy was getting desperate, John told Neville to make him profits by selling woods and allowing assaults. A new surge of disafforestation then took place in the spring of 1204, just as his fortunes in Normandy were collapsing. The earliest were in the Yorkshire forests of Rydale, number 13 on the map, if you can see the number, Wharfdale, number 17, <coughs> and Hartford Lythe, the very thin and mysterious one, 14, along a river which runs into the coast, uh, uh, runs away from the coast near Filing. Um, <coughs> when the king went south, the men of Essex purchased the disafforestation of the northern part of their county. Part of the cost was said in 1300 to have been paid by the Earl of Oxford, the only recorded involvement by a peer, but there's no contemporary evidence to confirm this. A charge to the men of Devon was for the whole county except Dartmoor and Exmoor to be disafforested. Elsewhere they were to be allowed to assault, make parks, take all manner of venison, have dogs, bows and arrows, and all other kinds of arms, and make deer loops. It was also specified that if the Bishop of Exeter, the Earl of Devon, or anyone else, wished to be participants in the fine in relation to their holdings, it is to be accounted to the men in their fine, and they are not to have the liberty of others. The financial arrangements for payment were for the men of the county to render a thousand marks each year, and others could only join in on specific terms. The bishop does seem to have tried to take advantage without contributing, because in the forest area of 1207, he was heavily fined after he and his men hunted in the forest of Devon and Cornwall, without conferring with the knights and other men of the two counties. So what is most likely to have happened is that the men of Devon, consisting of knights and freeholders, decided to take action at a meeting in the county court. 
A writ issued during the counting process was addressed to the collectors of the money for the disafforestation in Devon, who must have been chosen by the men of the county. The charter for Cornwall was similar, with non-participants who hunted liable to lose their dogs and horses and to incur a financial penalty. So that's 1204. After 1204, <coughs> there was a gap of nearly a decade during which fines by local commissioners for disafforestation almost ceased. Then John again came under increasing pressure from the opponents of his rule and ready to make further concessions in return for money. A plot against his life in 1212 forced him to ease his financial pressure on the forest applied by means of frequent forest heirs during the previous five years. After the disaster of the Battle of Boobings in 1214, he was forced to make many more concessions in many areas, including financial pressure on the inhabitants of forests. The most significant new grant made by John in the months before Magna Carta was to the Abbot of Peterborough and his knights and free tenants. For the first time, local documentation exists to illustrate in detail the nature of the local coalition established to offer money to the king, the means of establishing the liability of particular individuals to contribute, and the agreement on a, on a timetable for payment. <coughs> the cooperation between the lay and monastic elements was particularly striking at Peterborough, whose knights and freemen in 1190 even received their own forest charter without reference to the abbey. So the larger monastic houses, <coughs> who had for a century sought and often obtained particular forest privileges themselves, now sometimes allied them, ally themselves with local lay landowners. They often acted through the administrative and legal structures of county, hundred or wapentake courts, and had sometimes sophisticated administrative arrangements to collect the money. The mainly geographical rather than institutional ties which bound together the men of Wharfdale and Hartford Live seem far more informal, and illustrate even more graphically the determination of knights and free tenants to overcome the legal and economic disadvantages imposed on them by the forest laws. The overall process was nothing less than the earliest recorded popular movement in the history of England to circumscribe the power of the monarch in some localities. The forest was therefore bound to be a major point of contention between King John and his colonial opponents. The first demand of the forest issued in 1215 come in the so-called Unknown Charter, which includes certain alleged concessions by John but is in fact merely a radical wish list compiled sometime during negotiations in the early months of 1215. Of the 12 clauses, three relate to forest law administration. None of them appeared in the same terms in King John's Magna Carta, and two did not appear in it at all, so they didn't survive at the later stages of the negotiations. They were, however, the starting point of the process which resulted in the Charter of the Forest. The most striking of the forest clauses of the Unknown Charter dealt with the severe corporal punishments that the forest law imposed on those who carried out illegal hunting in the forest. There is the Latin text in the English translation. These penalties had been available to the forest administration throughout the 12th century and were probably used at least in the reign of Henry I. <clears throat> However, no official record of any such penalties being carried out against purchase exists. And the records of forest penalties in the pipe holes show that those of sufficient uh, social importance or wealth unable to pay could avoid punishment by mutilation. The renewed specification of blinding and emasculation for venison offences in the instructions of the Forest Justice of the of 1198, when contra contrasted with the relatively vague terms of this size of Woodstock of 1184, suggests that the penalties meted out during the reign of the younger Henry were less severe than those imposed by his grandfather. Some contemporary support for this exists. When William of Newborough, a normally reliable Yorkshire monastic chronicler, summed up the reign of Henry II, he concluded that although his administration of forest laws was severe, it was far less so than that of Henry I. His view has, has however, sometime, had somehow <coughs> to be reconciled that with a monk of ancient Abbey in 1196, who complained that in revenge for irrational wild animals, which ought by natural law to be available to all in common, he had either punished by death or cruelly mutilated in their limbs human beings who employ reason, who are saved by the same blood of Christ and share the same nature in equality. 
These ideas go back at least to John of Salisbury's public writings of 1159. <clears throat> no evidence of the carrying out of the Countess prescribed in 1198 can be found in the records of John Train. Indeed, when in 1205, as part of a general amnesty for prisoners, John ordered the release of all those held for forest offences, he accepted those convicted of hunting. They, however, were either to find pledges that they would not offend again or abjure the realm. No mention was made of corporal punishment, and these provisions closely presage the relevant course of the Charter of the Forest a dozen years later. John's professed attitude to poachers of low social status was different from his views relating to those of superior rank. In 1207, he instructed Brian de Lisle that the king's chief barons, passing through his administrative district, might take wild animals, as long as Brian knew who they were, and what, and how many they took. <clears throat> Most strikingly, he had, an, he had an explanation. Since we do not have our forests and our beasts for our use alone, but also for the use of our loyal men, but be sure to guard them well regarding poachers, because beasts are made more frightened by poachers than by the aforesaid barons. That always makes me laugh a little. This chapter of the Unknown Charter is the one provision of the whole process of negotiations leading to the Forest Charter in favour of the common man. It prescribed that no man was to lose his life or members, not no free man. It does not appear in the subsequent documents of 1215, perhaps because it was relatively little concerned to the Barons principally involved and concerned to achieve a settlement. It was only revived again for inclusion of the charge of the forest in 1217. You see the wording there. The comments of ecclesiastical writers on these subjects may well reflect the general feeling by some laymen, too, that they are unjust and specifically contrary to natural law. This concession met clerical concerns about corporal punishment and was a clear and unequivocal step away from the barbarism of the early forest law. The first forest clause of the Unknown Charter proposed the removal of forest law from all those areas to which it had been applied since that session of Henry II in 1154. This provision was extremely radical and created central difficulties of interpretation. Henry II's general principle of government had been to restore everything as much as possible to the position that they existed at the death of Henry I in 1135. <clears throat> the extent of the forest in Henry I's reign cannot be clearly known. And it's far from certain how many of the forests visited by justice after 1166 were first the forest at that time. The concession of that demand would make an enormous reduction in the area of rural forest in England. It was eventually conceded in the Charter of the Forest in 1217. But in 1215, it was more than John could stomach. It was negotiated away at Runnymede when only the reversal of John's own forestation was agreed. The larger concession being reserved as one of the matters which would be held over until the king had carried out his proposed crusade, his respite. He agreed that on his return, or if he failed to undertake the crusade at all, he would at once do full justice to complainants in these matters. The third clause of the Unknown Charter on the forest was in favour of knights who had private woods within the forest, allowing them a forest to serve them in parallel with the king's local forester. They could use their woods to feed grazing, grazing animals and provide fuel for heating. It does not allow the owners of woods to commit waste or create assaults for cultivation or the hunting of deer. <clears throat> this clause did not appear in many of the latest documents of 1215, and the Charter of the Forest in 1217 dealt with the matter of private woods in a different way. It's received very scant attention in historians, despite the fact it clearly arose from the wishes of knights living in the forest areas rather than from the barons who were leading the negotiations with the king. The view that the document referred to as the Articles of the Barons resulted from the beginnings of the negotiations of Runnymede on or about 10th of June 1215 is now widely accepted. The relevant cause of the Articles conceives that all the forests that were forested by the king in his time shall be disafforested, that is, all those royal forests created by John himself. This was included in Magna Carta five days later, in virtue of the same words, except for the qualifications it was to be done immediately. 
There is a sign of a relevant late amendment to the text of chapter 53 of the Charter, the, the Crusaders' respite, already mentioned. The third of the three insertions you should be able to just about see at the foot of this, the two copies of Magna Carta held in the British Library, generally named C1 and C2, added a little other small clarification to the advantage of the King. <coughs> the clause was retained in the November 12, 16 version of the Charter following John's death and they extended again to cover afforestations made by Henry II in the Charter of the Forest a year later. Now it's become common to say that since a great deal of afforestation took place under Richard and John, and not a very little new afforestation, this clause was significant only in that it was the first practical attempt to reduce the extent of the forest of <coughs> England. Richard indeed made no new forest, but John had a reputation as a strong defender of his forest rights. The author of the Histoire de Luc de Normandy later commented, not many years later, that in John's time the wild beasts enjoyed such protection that they pastured the fields like sheep. If they were chased, they only tried to rot, trot away and stopped when the hunters stopped. Moreover, there is evidence for his reign of summer forestation at Corfing Dorset and at Toxter near Liverpool. The king also confiscated net forest in Sussex from William de Breos, subsequently treating it as a new raw forest and specifically claiming it as such. More significant was the result of his financial pressure on the major Yorkshire baron, Nicholas de Stugdorf, who in 1205 was permitted to inherit the family estates only for an enormous fine of 10,000 marks, which he had to guarantee by surrendering property to the king, including his forest and castle of Knaresborough. This effectively <coughs> enabled John to acquire them, because it was unlikely that such a huge sum could ever be repaid. He ordered the forest to be returned fully to him as it had been when Henry II first gave it to William the Stuart, or his ancestor, in 1173. Before then, the forest had been a royal one, so in effect, John reforested it. Nicholas de Stuart became a leading northern rebel, the most important of those who brought the question of the forest boundaries into the rebel demands. And John's accident, uh, action, as we shall see, had important consequences after both their deaths. In the Articles of the Barons, there first appears another clause related to the forest boundaries in respect of those who lived just outside them. It was never dropped from the list of the King's concessions, being repeated with additional words of clarification, shown within square brackets, in Magna Carta a few days later, and finally in the Charter of the Forest in 1217. A custom, possibly a rule, had developed to require men not directly subject to forest law, but living near the forest boundaries, to appear at a forest air. The justices perhaps felt that those who lived nearby could easily commit forest offences by travelling only a short distance, and it provided extra potential fines if they absented themselves, of course. The custom certainly existed by 1209, when a jury of knights swore that all the men of Leicestershire, living up to three miles outside the forest, were bound to come to the pleas of the forest. This map shows the settlements lying just west of the boundary, and the potential increase in the numbers of people affected. So the western boundary is there. All these villages, <coughs> including the very important Langtons, quite a large section of villages at the, at the bottom there, uh, they were all within that uh, three mile boundary. Um, <coughs> Finally, the second part of the clause in the Articles of the Barons sought to authorise investigations to the misconduct of local officials, among whom the foresters were the most prominent, by panels of elected knights in each county. A few days later, a lengthier and much stronger version of the same clause became one of the final clauses in Magna Carta, as issued by the King. All evil customs of forests and warrens, foresters and warrens, sheriffs and their servants, real banks and their wardens, are to be investigated at once in every county by 12 sworn judge knights of the same county, and within 40 days of the inquiry they are to be abolished by them beyond recall, provided we are our justicia if we're not in England, first know of it, and again the, um, the brackets show the, 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 alteration, the alterations. Further, <clears throat> in the copies of the 1215 charter known as C1 and C2, the last part, the back of the plot, which is C, 
was added in at the bottom of the charter. The first of the three amendments already mentioned, evidence of another last minute alteration brought about by a late concession to the king. This line of material here is three separate insertions, two of them about the forest, which are, are marked, the possession of the text is marked by carrots. And you can get quite close to it soon enough. But they are there. <clears throat> Complaints against foresters are found throughout the 12th and early 13th centuries in the writings of clerics, and they bore the brunt of vocal resentment, sometimes expressed in a very savage fashion. In 1175, Henry himself, Henry II, ordered the hanging of four knights who had killed the forester and his assistants. Adam of Ancient, the biography of St. Hugh of Lincoln, tells of an unnamed forester killed in the forest where he worked. His arms and head were cut off, and the killers left his truncated body, so that severed head and limbs, in three different places, as a witness to his cruel, cruel treatment of local people. Ancient also wrote a general ringing invective against foresters. The worst abuse in the King of England, under which the country folk groaned, was the tyranny of the foresters. For them, violence took the place of law. Extortion was praiseworthy. Justice was an abomination, an innocence a crime. No one but the king himself was secure from their barbarity, or free from the interference of their tyrannical authority. So when the forest became a national political issue in 1215, demands for the curbing of the excesses and numbers of foresters were prominent. John himself punished forest, foresters for their, for their conduct, but on his own behalf, and probably because of their failure to keep his forests as he wished, rather than in response to complaints about them made by his subject. In 1209, Essex, according to the Dunstable Annals, after the king had ordered the destruction of all ditches, hedges, and houses built on assholes, 80 foresters were imprisoned, presumably because they had allowed these things to be dug or erected before being allowed to ransom themselves. In the same year, 128 foresters were taken as prisoners to the king at Winchester, though they, the sources don't show what their offences were. It's only after the plot against him in 12 Carl that John began to investigate the conduct of foresters in response to com complaints by his subjects. The Croman Chronicle states that John took pity on those afflicted by Forrester's near actions throughout almost all England. He remitted them and compelled senior Forrester to swear that they would only demand what they had been accustomed to demand in his father's time. The actual concessions eventually made in Magna Carta arose after the immediate situation of June 1215. The immediate point of cold night in each county to inquire into the bad customs of foresters. Probably in July, a letter from Langton and other bishops, perhaps at the king's behest, ordered that during the inquiries the normal forest customs had been maintained. But according to the Clarendon Chronicle, John's Northern's forests were attacked with the destruction of timber, killing of deer, instead of being administered normally pending, normally pending the results of the inquiries. This provided the king, following the papal annulment of the charter, with an excuse for all. The rebels obtained the support of Louis, the son of the French king, who invaded England in May 1216. War continued until John's death at the Bishop of Lincoln's castle at Newark in October 1216. It was followed by the immediate erasure of a revised version of Magna Carta by the advisers of the young Henry III, retaining the forest clause and negotiated at Runnymede to gain support for him. And as you know, that's the Durham 1216 Magna the only one to survive. The new version omitted the clauses which most restricted royal powers, including the proposed inquiries into the misdeeds of foresters, but it did retain the clause of the original charter promising the disforestation of the forest created by John and the restriction of the summoning of men living just outside the forest to attend forest, forest areas. The military struggle continued from the earlier year before the victory of the young King Henry III's supporters at Lincoln in May 1217, and <clears throat> withdrew the French army from England in September. A third version of Magna Carta was then issued. It did not include the forest clause of the first two, but that was because they were hived off into a new and separate charter of the forest, issued on the 6th of November 1217. This seems to be the point at which the term Magna Carta was coined when Chancery clerks were looking for an easy way of distinguishing between the two charters, and they did so by physical size. 
Magna Carta had three times the number of clauses the Forest Charter. And there they are, magic word, Magna Carta, as a carrot. <coughs> and uh, and that's written on the close roll. Only two originals of the smaller charter survive in two cathedrals, both damaged. There's a crucial difference between the two. The Durham copy is dated, the one at Lincoln is not. The date of the, link of the Durham charter is partly torn away, but as David Carpenter has pointed out, from what survives, it must be the 14th or 15th of November, 1217, and it's said to have been given at St Paul's in London by the young king's regent, William Marshall. Uh, you may not be able to see this, but uh, that letter there is certainly a cube, or most of a cube. And uh, what can I, the only things that appear in there which are relevant are uh, um, quarto, uh, quarto decimo or quinto decimo. So there's too much space for it to be anything shorter. And it ends in November, so it, it is November, but it's, it's, the date is generally thought, and I agree with this, to be the 14th or 15th of the month. By the middle of the month, Marshall was, at, was far west of London, so it says he's in London there, but he wasn't actually in London on the day that, that you think that is. It might be, mean that the copy was written on one of those dates, but it's not normal practice, so the date isn't apparently insoluble mystery. Also, it's not clear why a Durham copy, copy was written at all, since there was never a royal forest in the area, not a normal county, in the area, but not a normal county, it eventually became County Durham. The forest that we're there, was a private forest of the Bishop of Durham, completely outside the jurisdiction of royal forest officials and royal forest law. If it already existed as such by 1217, what is certain is that the charter was sent to the Bishop of Durham because it survived among the cathedral archives. The Bishop, Richard Marsh, was the King's Chancellor and it was written by a clerk in his department, the Chancery. Marsh's deputy as Chancellor, Ralph the Neville, was actually carrying out the functions of the office, while the bishop, not what he might in today's Portland's call a hands-on chancellor, remained in Durham. It might be therefore be valid to interpret it as a courtesy copy sent to the bishop as chancellor as an afterthought, and dated over a week after the version sent to the bishops with forests in their diocese. The charter consisted of 17 clauses the first being the radical concession the forest created by Henry II should be disafforested, and the demand also made in the preliminary negations and negotiations in 1215, but left out of Magna Carta. The next two were those restricting the forest boundaries, which had been included in the first charter. Who drafted the other 14 additional clauses of the forest charter is a question that no one has yet solved, although clearly it must have been done by a clerk or clerks and the servants of William Marshall, Keeper of the King and Kingdom, for the young king, who were knowledgeable about the forest laws and able to draw on the expert knowledge of lay forest officials. The Crowland Abbey Chronicle mentions frequent discussions about the governments of the kingdom, the stabilisation of peace, and the abolition of bad customs in the autumn of 1217 after the peace. And it was doubtless from some of those discussions that the terms of the forest charter emerged. The argument that it was based on information collected in the inquiries into the conduct of forest officials ordered by the summer of 1215 seems unconvincing, since no evidence that the inquiries took place has ever come to light, even though the original royal letter ordering them to be held in Gloucestershire has recently been identified among the archives of Harry Cathedral. Also, no one has yet satisfactorily explained why a separate forest charter was issued in 1217 rather than dealing with forest clauses issued in the main charter as before. Perhaps it was perceived that the implementation of the boundary clauses uh, within it required immediate executive action, whereas the clauses of the revised Magna Carta do not. <coughs> Although it assumed without question the King's right to have his forest and forest law, in all respects the charter of the forest was a truly revolutionary document. As Sir James Holt cogently put it, the charter marked a sharp break. Hitherto, the forest law and the extent of the forest had largely been a matter for the king. Now, the community is intervening to regulate its boundaries, investigate its officials, and amend its regulation. 
The remaining 13 clauses have three main themes. First, the rights and privileges of those who have private woods within the forest boundaries. Second, the setting of limits on the power of the king's foresters by defining what they could and could not do, and by seeking to limit their numbers. Finally, he gave amnesties for offences committed between 1154 and 1217, from outlawed for trespass against the venison, and from damaging woodland or cultivating cleared land. All forest landowners to remain answerable for any future clearances and cultivation. The most important men with private woods within the forest boundaries were manorial lords, who had a strong interest in getting their woods excluded from the forest because of the economic and jurisdictional benefits that would accrue to them and their men. The royal assizes of the reign of Henry II had included causes, uh, causes about, forest, about private woods. The first asserted the responsibility of all foresters over men having private woods within the forest, and prescribed that they could not give or sell anything from them, only satisfy their own needs. The impression given by these texts is of increasing restrictions, or at least the maintenance of an existing strict code. The forest charter conceded that, in his land in the forest, any free man could have a mill, a fish pond, a pond, a mall, or a ditch, uh, a mall pit, or a ditch, or have arable land outside the cupboard, as long as he did not uh, harm a neighbour. These terms enable, mark a huge enabling increase in the jurisdictional, jurisdictional and economic feeling of the owners of the woods in the forest in contrast to the restrictions and control of the previous regulator regime. The influence of the major landers supports the king element here, improving considerably a lot of all those with private woods, from bishops and earls right down to free tenants. Chapter 11 added a further privilege to those already highly privileged, giving archbishops, bishops, earls and barons <coughs> the right when travelling through a forest to take one or two beasts under the supervision of the forester, blowing a horn to publicise the event if the forester was not present. In the 1220 drive version of the charter, the wording was changed to limit this to occasions when the baron had been summoned to go to the king and was travelling through the forest. The remaining clauses are a set of a code of rules, the management of the forest and the conduct of the foresters. Some provisions were long established and others perhaps unprecedented. For example, as before, the lawing of dogs was to play, take place every three years at the same time as the regard. But in future, the punishment for an unlawed dog would not be the forfeiture of an ox, but the monetary penalty of three shillings. This is the first chapter of the Charter recorded as having been enforced, exactly two years after it was issued. A common theme was an attempt to restrict and regulate the activities of foresters and to prevent unscrupulous seal to their own profit. For example, one clause regulates a tax called cheminage levied by foresters on some goods being carried through their bailiwicks. <coughs> Only a senior forester was infused to be allowed to collect it in specified amounts, only from men coming from outside his area, and only where it had been customarily collected. The Charter's rather ineffectual response to complaints about the number of foresters was that there were to be as many as seemed to be reasonably sufficient for keeping the forests. Not surprisingly, these complaints continued subsequently. In 1279, the inhabitants of a forest in Somerset accused senior foresters of appointing too many foresters in order to receive money from those wishing to hold the office themselves and profit from it. The crucial first clause of the Forest Charter dealt with the boundaries as the culmination of the negotiations that began in 1215. The King had agreed now that all the woods forest, a forest of Henry II after 1154 <coughs> should be viewed by trustworthy local men, and if any wood other than Henry's own demeanour had been forested, it would be disafforested. Implementation of this clause was bound to be difficult and could only be tackled properly on a county by county or even a forest by forest basis. Also, many who lived outside the forest were not in future to be obliged to obey the common summons of the justice of the heir, for the forest heir to attend the heirs, unless they were themselves involved in a plea or were pledges for others who were. This clause had already been, had already been included in the 1215-1216 versions of Wayne Carter. The main issue was the extent of the forest themselves. 
There are problems in establishing which of them were first created on Henry II, since knowledge of what had happened, which depends on local communal memory, as expressed through the verdicts of the local juries, who recorded the boundaries under the supervision of royal commissioners <coughs> in documents called perambulations. It's impossible to survey this, the process in detail this evening. All that can be said is to say something about the government's attitude and changes of policy and look at local attitudes through evidence from a few counties. Because of the rich, richness of the documentary material that survives from these years, for the first time in the history of English government, it is possible to trace in detail the implementation of a government policy. The process of establishing and implementing the boundary clause is lengthy and complex, over a decade in the first instance, and about a century in the medium term. As contentious issues were in some counties repeatedly re revisited. In that first decade, there were several phases, with initially three attempts between 1218 and 1220, under the regime of John Marshall as Chief Forester, to settle the disputed boundaries. And amazingly enough, archival survived without the actual letter of appointment, letter close to John Marshall, the appointing John Marshall. You see it was, uh, from the bottom there, it's issued on the, on the 8th of November. 1217, two days after the date of the charter. Over the winter of 1217-18, nothing was done to implement the charter of the forest. But in April 1218, Marshall, and the sheriffs of the forest counties, were ordered to cause it to, to be sworn to and firmly observed. Copies have been circulated along with copies of Magna Carta in late February and early March with an order to the Sheriff of Yorkshire and perhaps others to have them publicly proclaimed in the county court. You may be able to see the, um, the uh, record type um, version of the letter from Robert Klaus there. You see that the Durham is included. Um, <clears throat> it's pro probable the surviving Lincoln Charter, not dated, was one of these, but no Durham Charter is mentioned. The process seems to have begun only after the government's hand was forced by local initiatives in a few counties. In Nottinghamshire, the men of the county recorded the perambulation as early as the 21st of May 1218 in the Nottinghamshire Jarmyshire Joint County Court. They claimed that it was carried out under royal order. It proposed the disafforestation of most of the extensive forest in the county, which it was claimed to be made, first be made forest in the Henry II by Alan de Neville thereby reducing its boundaries to encompass the well-ordered core of raw domain land in the west of the county, uh, and the fra a fraction of the original area. The jurors were, as we might expect, gentry mainly from the east of the county. So, in the, in the 12th century, the forest, the whole of Nottinghamshire, south, uh, south of the Trent, and, sorry, north of the Trent, there, the whole of the rest of the county was forest, and at the end of this process, all that remained was this. <clears throat> a similar initiative by the men of Huntingdonshire about six weeks later did become a matter of immediate concern to the government. Its effect would have been to disafforest the whole of the county except for real three year old domain woods because they attributed their forestation to the rest of the county to Henry II and Alan de Nell. And the three woods we're talking about, those enclosed areas, nice to draw on this map um, by speed. Uh, you can't, you can see hardly any of it now because the planet there has been marked by new development. Um, and the bottom one, is, they're not marked, but not named, is Hart Hay. Um, <clears throat> another, was in, an, another unofficial formulation was made in Cumberland, but they were all subsequently repudiated by the King's Council. Marshall officially began work at Leicester in June 1218, two perambulations surviving from that session, apparently written by local scribes. One, that's Sean for up, and you see completely different hands. That's a very non-chancery non hand, that one. Um, <clears throat> the King's Council became increasingly alarmed and encroachments against rural rights. In 1219, Inquiries were ordered into assaults made in both Crown and private woods since 1217, and which had been sown with corn. 
And there is, as a result, those who had certain such assaults in, assaults in 17 counties were summoned to appeal before the King's Council. Men of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire even went to Darley Abbey in Derbyshire to ask the, the papal legate Pandolf to save for them the courtroom in their assaults. And that's the actual letter passing on this complaint that uh, the, the um, <coughs> legate wrote, presuming in his own hand, to Hubert de Burr. The government soon relented and all the return of the court found in the assaults to those who had seen it. So after 1220, the council, fearful that raw rights were being eroded, reverted to attempts to govern the forests in the manner customary before 1212. Marshall was replaced in 1221 by Brian the Lion, a former chief northern forest of King John, who tried to revive forest areas in 1222. The men of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire managed to postpone their heir twice by payments to the lion. Events in Yorkshire were more dramatic. An attempt to bring a, begin an heir in 1222 at York caused major opposition. A group of barons and knights, most of them former rebels, refused to come to York for the heir. Those who did come heard Walter, heard Walter of Sowerby order everyone to withdraw and appeal to the Pope that the summons again to the air was against the king's liberties, a clear reference to the forest charter. Sowerby had been the steward of the rebel Nicholas of Stoupia, from whom John had taken Knaresborough Castle and Forest in 1205. He was fined 50 marks for his outburst, and a number of others had to pay lesser sums for contempt in not attending the air. Nevertheless, the council's reaction was to postpone any further forest airs from midsummer 1222 to midsummer 1223. So no agreed progress on the forest boundaries had therefore been made in nearly six years. And in the later months of 1224, the survival of the charter as a, as a whole, and especially the boundary clauses, seems to have been in the balance. The turning point came with the king's pressing need for money to recover Gascony, which resulted in the issue of two charters, the two charters in their final form on the 11th of February 1225, in return for a grant of taxation. In 1217, the charter had been granted on the advice of the bishops, earls and barons, sealed by William Marsh and the papal legate. This time it was done with the spontaneous and free will of the king, and sealed with his own great seal. When Hugh de Neville protested that the Dorset jury intended to disafforce a large part of their county to the king's disadvantage, he was instructed to warn them not to do this, but if they nonetheless persist, it's necessary to accept it for the moment until an opportunity arises for us to amend it. The St Albans chronicler Roger of Wendover, predecessor of Matthew Paris, later wrote that the magnates, knights and free tenants of the newly afforested districts made full use of these concessions, not overlooking one iota of the contents of the charter, by cutting and selling timber from their woods, making assarts, and bringing waste into cultivation, and hunting deer. Even the very dogs, he wrote, formerly accustomed to be mutilated, rejoiced to have these liberties. The main issue seemed to have been resolved, but then, early in 1227, the young king took personal control of affairs and immediately aggressively disputed some of the boundary issues, apparently resolved two years before. According to Wendover, Henry and Melbourne Council, the Charter of the Liberties of the Forests and all the counties of England, after they'd been in practice throughout the whole of England for two years, because he alleged that the charters had been granted when he was under the care of a guardian and had no power over his own body or seal. The king ordered jurors who made the perambulations in four counties to appear before him to explain why they had disafforested some areas that had been before forest before 1154. In 1228, the king actually asserted that the forest in Staffordshire had originally been created by Henry I, and that Henry II had reforested it after it had been destroyed in the reign of King Stephen, and ordered that its bounds would be maintained as they had been under King John. In that year, the jurors who had made the perambulations in seven counties were summoned before the king to acknowledge that they had trespassed in making their perambulations through ignorance and error, and to seek his pardon. Significant reforestations took place as a result, and later in the same year, similar action was taken against the jurors in 18 other counties. The Northampton jurors were still being summoned to explain their perambulation to the king, 
as late as 1231. By then, however, most of the controversy was over for the present, and matters began to settle down as other concerns came to the fore. In Lincolnshire, Leicestershire and Yorkshire between the news and Derwent, the remaining issues were settled between 1230 and 1235, and without prime relations, but by the old method of a fine followed by a royal charter, because it was accepted they had originally been created before 1154. Here, the Bishop of Durham at last makes an appearance. With the backing of the Archbishop of York and the Abbot of St. Mary's York, in 1234 he purchased, for the sum of 800 marks, the disafforestation of the forest between the Ouse and the Derwent in Yorkshire. Although there was no royal forest in his diocese, the Bishop had extensive estates in that sort of Yorkshire, that part of Yorkshire, based on his manor at Howden. Oh, sorry, go back one, please. <coughs> uh, down to the bottom, how did you walk and take, which is Durham Territory, is right at the bottom there, next to Durham. An endangered triangulation, probably made in 1220, had asserted the area had been a forest of Ireland and Ireland in the 1160s, but the council had rejected it, and even sent in a commissioner to protect the status quo. In Nottinghamshire, the boundaries seem to have been settled in 1227, but what happened was, Henry complained so they had another perambulation, uh, and just that bit was excluded in the 12, in the 1218 one. They just added that looking again as a salt to the king, and a, a much smaller, more intimate area on that side. So it was just getting king happy, but in fact they got a, a, a really great deal. Uh, in Nottinghamshire, the boundaries seemed to have been settled in 1227. In 1232, a further fine was paid for a charter, confirming that this forestation which had been carried out. The men of the county benefited greatly, its forests being much reduced. The King's complaint in 1227 about the boundaries resulted in two, only two minor adjustments, which I've just pointed out. They got away with a great deal, because the whole of the county north of the Trent had been forest in the reign of Henry I. But the men of Huntingdonshire were not so successful, because the whole of their county remained forest until further prime relations in 1301. Meanwhile, in Nottinghamshire and many other counties, the attention of the gentry in the disafforested areas soon turned to the purchase of royal charters of free warren, giving them exclusive rights to the hunting for lesser beasts of the chase in their own manners, eventually leading to the game laws of the 18th century. All those dots represent a charter of free warren granted in a period of less than 20 years. Quite remarkable. By 1235, then, the process started by the Charter of the Forest had for the moment been completed, and the overall extent of the English forest was greatly reduced, as this map shows. The size and shape of most forests um, had been settled for the moment, and in 1237 the Charter again confirmed for another grant of taxation. The Forest Charter had a profound but gradually decreasing effect on the political, economic and social geography of the English Shires for centuries to come. The men of the disafforested areas had to remain vigilant, however. During their periods as Chief Justice of the Forest in the 1240s and 1250s, Robert Passeroo and then Geoffrey de Langley both sometimes acted as if the changes brought about by the Charter had not occurred. But, along with Magna Carta, it had become so firmly established in the 1220s that any attempt to reverse its effect was doomed to failure. It was occasionally cited in forest areas. For example, in 1262, when Roger held at Hillary, he used to establish his right to rebuild his mill in the Suffolkshire Forest of Kinder without interference from foresters. In 1279, the men of the forest next morning and um, mended in Devon produced a long list of grievances against the failure to observe the terms of the charter, of which they were clearly aware. Later, in Edward the first reign, a period of a crisis after 1297, some of the boundaries were revisited and further concessions made with a few further changes under Edward II, but it became less and less relevant to the administration of the Royal Forest as time went on, although Royal Forest rights were not formally abolished until 1971. <coughs> now, however, in this is October centenary year, the Charter is being celebrated internationally by envir environmental lawyers as having transcendent importance in society's adaptations to cl changing climatic conditions and in stimulating resilient norms for stewardship and stewardship of nature. Perhaps these ideas will be its claim to fame for the next hundred years. Thank you.